I first heard about the Bill Gates speech from some English language newspapers I bought at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam after I'd lost all my money at the casino there. I only had enough left <laughs> for newspapers. While I was waiting for a plane to Guangzhou, China, and I read Gates' words on the way, on the way through the sports pages, with none registering as anything more than customary hyperbola. So it was with some surprise I learned upon landing in the enormous city which used to be called Canton that my Chinese hosts seemed to want to talk about nothing else. Furthermore, the local press in China was full of gates, or so I was told, and the internet was buzzing with Gates' commentary. Setting aside the venal possibility that schools and colleges are such a money tree for Microsoft, he hardly could have spoken otherwise at the National Education Summit, I was impressed with the boldness, the cheek, the profound chutzpah of a famous dropout lecturing the nation on the necessity of a college education when he had none. If it were as necessary as he said, I asked myself, why hadn't he bothered to go back to college in all those decades since he left, left after his freshman year, I might add. What improvements would college have made in Gates' current situation? If it were only Gates in this uncollege status, I might overlook the irony of a university being proposed as a solution to America's economic woes, which are horrible and are getting worse. But it isn't only Gates who has written himself a pass from the expensive and time-consuming ritual of college, and well, Mr. Gates knows it. He did drop out after a single year and never went back, but then, so too did his partner in the founding of Microsoft, Paul Allen, who's worth 15 or 20 billion. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, dropped out of Reed College after one semester, and eventually he hooked up, not with a Stanford graduate, not with an MIT graduate, but with Steve Wozniak, another dropout, who co-founded Apple with him. Michael Dell of Dell Computer, didn't bother with a college degree either. Larry Ellison, the CEO of Oracle, saw through the illusion of seat time in college being peddled as education at an early enough age to spare himself its pernicious effects. And I could go on in this vein for some time, but I think I've made the point at least about the computer phenomenon. Its vital genius is in large measure a gift to the rest of us from men who turned their backs on college. Would this technical revolution be sweeping the planet if Gates or Dell or Jobs had remained in college? Or for that matter, if John D. Rockefeller or Andrew Carnegie or Henry Ford had? Don't be too quick to answer that question or you'll be certain to embarrass yourself you get some measure of the near uniformity of news control in America when you find slight mention of this awesome data, nor hear such questions publicly asked. Is it any wonder critical thinking has been an exile from institutional schooling? If you feel like joining the throng of fans for Gates' college proposal, if you strongly believe he was telling it as it really, really is, then you are obligated to explain why it doesn't seem to be that way in one of the principal businesses keeping us afloat in the global marketplace. You need to explain to yourself first and to me second precisely what it is about seat time, canned lectures, vetted textbooks, homework, and paper-pencil testing, which creates a vigorous, productive intellect. Can you do that? Don't feel bad if you can't. Nobody can. 
It's an act of religious faith, not science. <laughs>